Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. Today we are looking at completing the final experimental rocket planes contracts. Since its maiden flight in last episode, the KX-1 has seen four more flights, giving it five flights in total. The first of this episode is launched from a static position on the runway, and the remaining three are all launched in the air via the KCT air launch which simulates dropping off of the wing of a B-52 or B-52 derivative, something along those lines, um, and is right now capped at, I think, 7,600 meters and 150 meters per second. Give or take a few, I don't remember exactly what the altitude is set. However, as we unlock more tech nodes, we will also unlock the capability of air launching at higher altitudes and higher speeds, which would be very nice. Um, I had a little bit of issues with this one, um, with the KX-1 specifically, because it really likes to dive down at that altitude and that speed with no thrust behind it. So lighting up the A4 engine um, had to be done in a sort of slow dive and then I don't really like the flight, um, the flight trajectory of this of these missions because it pulls a lot of G's on the crew, and it kind of pushes the KX-1 to its limit. I was actually surprised that it didn't break apart. In fact, a few times in simulations doing these missions, the vehicle did break apart during the high G maneuvers, but we seemed to luck out for the most part. And these flights we're looking to fulfill experimental rocket plane contracts, trying to finish out um, all of them. And they completed three of the four experimental rocket plane contracts, uh, reaching 12 kilometers, 700 meters per second, um, again, then to reaching 20 kilometers and 905 meters per second. And I believe that was the limit of the KX-1's capabilities and this led to the development of the KX-2 later on. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. In January of 1953, the KX-1 saw its final flight, the fifth and final flight, um, and unfortunately this mission was riddled with problems from the get-go, which led to its ultimate demise. Um, in the editor, I had neglected to fill the oxygen tanks when refueling, and this led to, well, the pilot slowly losing oxygen to breathe as the altitude increased. And this isn't a problem at low altitudes, but this particular flight is reaching 33 kilometers in altitude. And this is above the service ceiling for the KX-1, which means at that altitude, the pilot is not able to breathe. And this actually, um, this actually leads to the pilot blacking out momentarily as the aircraft started to nosedive. Now, even as the pilot regained consciousness during the nosedive, it could not maintain its initial flight plan of pulling out into a rather shallow dive leading to the KSC runway because the pilot would run out of oxygen and black out once again and possibly lose control permanently of the aircraft until it splashed down into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. So what needed to happen 
was the pilot needed to dive down as fast as possible to a very low altitude so that he could breathe again. But unfortunately, what this means is bleeding off way, way too much velocity to reach the KSC runway again. And I, I very much debated bailing out of the, of the aircraft, but I figured, well, we should be able to splash down into the ocean perfectly fine. And considering it, maybe some things breaking off the aircraft at most, um, this would be much better than possibly, possibly losing the life of a Kerbal, the first of the series. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the Atlantic Ocean proved quite unforgiving, and I believe I actually splashed down at much too high a speed and this caused the immediate and rapid disassembly of the vehicle, which the cockpit ended up surviving initially. And at this point, I also attempted on Bill jumping out of the craft, which he was able to just before splashing down into the Atlantic Ocean at a high velocity once more and never to be seen again. So in January of 1953, Bill Kerman became the first loss of the series, both pushing Kerbals and our current technology to their limits, um, and we will definitely remember him fondly. Uh, shortly afterwards, in the first quarter of 1953, the S2 saw another launch, or in this case, launch attempt. Uh, because unfortunately there was an issue with arming the parachutes at launch. I wanted to give it a shot just to see if, I, if they would wait until downward velocity, but unfortunately they deployed upon liftoff and, well, caused the craft to reach 500 meters and then parachute to safety. <laughs> so at least there was no explosions. Or should I say unfortunately there was no explosions. To end on a bit of a higher note, despite the disaster of the first quarter in 1953, later on in the year saw the KX-2's finished construction and first successful flight, reaching 32 kilometers, which is still pushing the boundaries of the conic cockpit in its current tech level, uh, which means there are still oxygen problems up there and you can't stay above 30 kilometers for more than a few seconds, really. However, it completed this successfully and was able to glide back to the runway.
Now this particular design is more suited for high G maneuvers and less suited for low altitude, low speed flight, which is a reason why it sports a pair of drag parachutes since it has to come down to the runway at a much higher velocity than the KX-1 did. Rolling to a stop, that's gonna do it for this one. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.